Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. I think it's something as medical professionals we need to be very clear with our patients and their families about is how much benefit you might expect. No one on that FDA advisory committee voted to approve this drug. I'm Jonathan All in for Sarah Fenske. Aduelm is the first drug approved for Alzheimer's disease in more than 20 years. But along with its promise comes severe risks and a severely large price tag. The concerns over the drug led three experts who warned against approval to resign from an FDA panel in protest. Major health providers, including the Cleveland Clinic and Mount Sinai Hospital, announced yesterday they will not be administering the medication. Joining me in studio to talk about it is Dr. Joyce Snyder, a neurologist at Washington University's Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, the principal investigator of the school's study on the drug. Dr. Snyder, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Great to be here, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. We'd also like listeners in on the conversation. If you have a loved one who has Alzheimer's and you've heard of this drug, you're excited, you're scared, both, give us a call at 314-382-TALK. That's 314-382-8255, or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpr.org. Dr. Snyder, maybe we should start with, in theory, how the drug works. My understanding is that it removes this kind of sticky goop that can be on the brains of a lot of Alzheimer's patients. Maybe you can (laughs) enlighten us with a more technical uh, explanation of how it works. Sure, happy to do so. So in Alzheimer's disease, the the changes that happen in the brain include amyloid plaques, which are, uh, goop is a good word, but they're uh, aggregates of of proteins, of of components of the cells that form outside the nerve cells and may interfere with how nerve cells interact with each other. Uh, There's another hallmark called tau, which accumulates inside the nerve cells, but this particular drug, aduhelm, is an antibody that circulates in your blood and in ways we don't completely understand helps clear that amyloid plaque out of the brain. Do we know for sure that removing that plaque can reduce the symptoms, the length or the intensity of Alzheimer's? That, that's the, the $56 billion or $100 billion question. Uh, we know that the plaque is something that starts to accumulate very early, even before symptoms start, and it's present by the time people have symptoms. Uh, we know that in animal studies, if you remove the plaque it tends to help with some of the symptoms we can detect there. But the key question with this drug and with all the drugs targeting amyloid is, does removing that plaque after somebody has symptoms really have an impact on their memory and thinking? Does it slow down the worsening of memory and thinking, or does it even improve it, or does it not do anything at all? Is this the the first drug that has been approved to remove those plaques? Yes, so this is the first drug, as you said, in, in almost 20 years. And it's the first one that is specific to the disease, that targets the disease pathology. Uh, So it's the first one that has been approved to remove the plaques. And that was one of the big surprises of the FDA decision because several drugs have shown that they can remove the plaques, but they weren't didn't seek approval on that basis because approval was going to be based on how well they changed the symptoms. So that was one of the big changes with this FDA decision. Speaking of the FDA decision, it it was very controversial. Um, What are your feelings on it? And or maybe we should start with what was Washington University's uh, study about with this medication? Well, we were, the, the study that we did was part of the large study done to help approve this drug. So when you have a big drug study like that, for this one, they were enrolling Um, 1,600 people worldwide, and so there are many different sites where that happens, and and our university was one of those sites, and I was the leader at that site. So we enrolled about 10 people at our site. We still have seven people who are on the drug. So we were one of the performance sites to test that drug. And what's your uh, feeling about the, the efficacy of it and the risks that are involved with it. So this drug was one that generated a lot of excitement almost four years ago when the, the first, the preliminary studies came out because there was a hint there that it reduced the plaques and that was associated with improving the symptoms. So we were really excited about it. That was the first time that had been shown. 
the study that was done was was designed well, but it was incomplete because it got stopped in the middle. So what we were left with at the end was a study that only a few people completed the study at the highest dose of drug and not, you know, the 800 people on drug and the 800 people not on drug. So the results, again, were promising, but they were incomplete. So most of us, uh, particularly the Alzheimer's experts at WashU, when we meet to talk about it, agree it's, it's still promising, but it did not prove that it changes the clinical outcome. Why was it stopped? It was stopped because, well, I mean, I can't speak for the company, but my understanding is when these trials are really expensive, they cost hundreds of millions to a billion dollars to do because they're worldwide, involve lots of people. And so the companies don't want to do the whole three to four year study if it's not going to work. So they did an analysis in the middle to see if it was going to work and the word came back, no. Well, then several months later, they analyzed the extra data they had before they stopped it and said, oops, maybe it does work. So that's what happened. I think we wouldn't be having these conversations today if the study had been completed as planned. <laughs> it sounds like a bad way to do medicine to a, a layperson. Well, it sounded like a bad way to do medicine to a lot of us as well. You know, I'm not a statistician, and, and I certainly don't run a drug company, so they, they may have other things to think about. But it, it seems like once you have invested that much time and effort and, and the efforts of the participants, the people who are in these studies, and it, it would really, we, we were very disappointed when the study was stopped. Well, between the incomplete study and side effects, including swelling in mm -hmm. the brain and bleeding in the brain, mm -hmm. why did this get approved? Uh, I, again, I don't know what, what the FDA was thinking. I think that's something we'll, we'll find out as time goes on. But uh, it has been almost 20 years since we had a drug approved. There are six to seven million people with this disease right now and they're suffering, their families are suffering. So there was a lot of pressure to approve something that might have some promise. Um, so I, I, I think that's what part of the thinking was, but it's hard to know. And, and there, is, there is some promising data in there in the, in, the, in the studies that were done. It's just not enough data for most of us to say, you know, give it a full approval as was given. In your professional opinion, do you think some Alzheimer's patients patients should be taking this drug? I think it, it might offer benefit to some with very mild disease. So, you know, we are currently formulating our plan at WashU as to how to offer this drug. And most of us agree it should be offered to people that have very mild disease because that's where it might work. It's not going to work in people with more severe disease, uh, that it should be closely monitored. Uh, and, you know, that people should be aware of the risk and benefits before they go in. You said how you might administer the drug. Mm -hmm. So for Washington University, it's a, not a question of if, but just how? Right. I, those discussions are still going on. We've mm -hmm. been talking about this for a year and a half since, you know, this drug first you know, began to make noises about being approved. So we don't have a final policy yet. Uh, but, you know, many of us have the same reservations as the folks at Cleveland Clinic and at Mount Sinai. But our thinking is that we want to offer this to people where it might be a benefit and let our patients and their families take part in that decision. So, so we are, I am not leaning towards a hard stop. I can't speak for all my colleagues, so that remains to be seen. Well, you, you mentioned for people who are very early in the disease, mm -hmm. and actually one of the things that uh, the, the drug manufacturer uh, tried to, they say, clarify mm -hmm. <laughs> when they released some new rules after it was applied and after the backlash started was that it only needs for mi mild to maybe medium. Yeah. Uh, how, what kind of improvements do you actually see from somebody who's in the mild, for early stages of Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. even if the drug works as perfectly as possible, mm -hmm. what kind of improvement do you see? So we don't see improvement. So people with Alzheimer's disease get worse over time. Mm -hmm. So what you see, and, and in the most promising data that, that was shown, and, and we don't know if this is what it's going to look like after many more people are tested, uh, it slowed the, the worsening over a year by about a third, which is, which is substantial. I mean, that's more than anything else we have if, if it works that well. But that's the question. Is it a challenge, though, to figure out... How, what kind of, uh, to, to evaluate the efficacy in any individual when you're saying that it progressed a third uh, less? less. <laughs> it, it's a huge challenge, and it's the same challenge we have with the medications we have right now, the, the pills that people are currently taking. They don't make anybody better, 
Uh, people may feel like they get better in the first couple of weeks because, you know, there's a, 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 an effect of, hooray, I'm taking a pill. But it's the same thing. In an individual person, it's basically impossible to tell if the drug is working, which is why we need to do big studies with hundreds to thousands of people very carefully monitored to figure out if something is working. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be back shortly specifically to, to talk about the cost of this medication. Our conversation continues. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back to our conversation about Adulam, a new and controversial drug that treats Alzheimer's disease. I'm speaking with Dr. Joyce Snyder, a neurologist at Washington University. If you'd like to get in on our conversation, make a comment or ask a question, you can call us at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK, or you can send us a tweet at STL on air, or email us at talk at STLPR. Dot org. Dr. Snyder, uh, the cost of this medication has gotten a lot of uh, attention. $56,000 a year is the price tag to take this medication. Um, when you're determining whether a patient should take a medication, especially one that we're not totally sure whether it's going to work, how much does price play into that from a medical standpoint? From a medical standpoint, we, we would hope the price wouldn't play into it at all, but it's certainly something we discuss with our patients, particularly how much they might end up having to pay. And I just add 56000 is the cost of the drug itself. That doesn't include the cost of getting the monthly IV infusions, uh, having the MRI scans to monitor for safety or any doctor visits you need. So most estimates are the price, total price will be, you know, eighty three, eighty five thousand $85,000 a year. For me, it's easy to um, to talk about it in a disaffected way. Mm-hmm. But if it was me who had Alzheimer's or if it was one of my loved ones, or my uncle who passed away mm-hmm. w- with Alzheimer's, um, I would do anything, mm-hmm. even for a, 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 a far chance at getting some improvement. Is it fair to people who are in that position to put so much money on the line for something that might help a little? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great question, and it's 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 not fair. And I think it's something as medical professionals we need to be very clear with our patients and their families about is how much benefit you might expect. Uh, we have that with the current drugs, although at a much lower price tag. That for some of the current drugs for for folks with more severe disease, I sometimes advise my patients their their money might be better spent on a caregiver or a vacation or something you know their loved one would enjoy rather than on on some of the current medications that offer very limited benefit. So that's something we're going to have to weigh very carefully. Even with this, do you get the sense that there's still demand? Do people want this drug? Uh, absolutely. So there, there are people who want this drug and people who can afford it uh, and who will, you know, get it if they can afford it. That's one of the big concerns is that for folks who do not have insurance or have insurance with a large copay, who don't have a lot of income, that they, you know, even the ones that are appropriate for this drug and might benefit would not be able to get it. And that's a big medical justice concern for us. I, I I like to think about the macro and the micro on these Mm -hmm. kinds of things. From the macro level, I think it's maybe a little bit easier to say, if people try this drug, you know, then we're going to know more about it. We're going to know its effects. It'll be out there longer. A generic would eventually Mm -hmm. be available. It's easy to say that, you know, if this drug exists and it might do some help, let's leave it out there. Mm -hmm. But on a micro level, if you take out a second mortgage on your house, for a drug that may not work, may make things worse, and if it does work, it'll only work in a small mm-hmm. increment, then it's an obvious no. How do you balance that looking at public health on the large scale while still realizing that we're talking about individual patients? Yeah, it's 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 tough and it's a great question. And, and even on the macro level, you know, if we, everybody who is eligible for this drug got it, that would double the cost of drugs for Medicare, basically. So we would all end up paying more and it may also crowd out other drugs, other other things being investigated, may uh, discourage folks from being in trials of other drugs. So there's a lot of other side effects. And then, you know, for the individual person, 
if you get the second mortgage for this drug, then you, you can't afford the caregiver you need as the disease gets more severe so it, or, or other things that you might need. So it's, it's, it's tough. And I think uh, most experts who've analyzed this agree that the drug is overpriced. I mean, there have been many estimates of what it would be worth if it worked as well as, as it, you know, it could. And that's more on the order of, I think, you know, eight to $11,000 a year rather than 56000 Let's talk about the FDA a little bit. And I know you don't work for the FDA, and I, I know that, mm. that, that you are one very well-respected doctor mm. with your own opinions, but um, the fact that scientists resigned from an FDA a panel mm. over mm -hmm. this, um, the, the, the FDA is now asking the drug's approval to be federally investigated. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's so much controversy around this. Did the FDA jump the gun? I think many of us were surprised at the decision, and one of the folks who resigned was my colleague, Dr. Joel Perlmutter, whom I hold in great regard, and he wrote a great essay about why he resigned. So I, I think I completely respect the folks who resigned and, and all the folks on the committee. I mean, no one on that FDA advisory committee voted to approve this drug. Uh, I think all of them voted no except for one abstention. So. Um, Really, I think the way the FDA operated on this was very different than their usual mode of operation, and I'm glad there's going to be an investigation. Do you think the media attention on this has played a significant impact in the drug and how it's being used? Well, I, I, anecdotally, I, I know that the first week after the approval, I had several patients in my office, and they were all very excited about the drug. And two weeks later, as the negative press began to come out, they were very well informed and were all saying, we don't want this drug because it's, it's too controversial. So I think the media has really helped to in, inform the public discussion and, and to promote the public discussion. So that's a, that, that's a great thing. Well, is there anything practical that you think could bring the cost down? I, well, I th the cost has been set by the company. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the FDA could mandate that as part of their investigation. Uh, the company has said they will have a patient assistance program for those who cannot afford the drug, uh, which is great in theory. Uh, in practice, sometimes those programs are very cumbersome and hard for people to, to qualify for, and they still have copay. So it remains to be seen how well that will work. Let's try to uh, get a caller in here. Aaron from St. Louis has a question. Aaron, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Hello. Go ahead with your question. Oh, my question is in regards to uh, because the drug was not fully approved, it's been accelerated, uh, Amgen has X amount of years to, not Amgen, I'm sorry, uh, Biogen has X amount of years to uh, actually do, uh, answer whatever question that they had that convinced FDA to approve of it. Um, do you have any insight into any of that at all? Aaron, thanks for your question. Dr. Yeah, Snyder. no, Aaron, that's a great question. So the FDA gave Biogen nine years to do the studies to prove that the drug has clinical efficacy, uh, which, which, you know, these studies take a long time, but that seems like a pretty extraordinarily long amount of time. Uh, the only insight I have is that uh, at our site and other sites where the, the study was conducted, we are still continuing that study on the folks who are in the study. They're now in what's called the open label extension part of the study, which means everybody who was in the study, whether they got the placebo or the drug, is now getting active drug. And we are following those folks very closely. Um, and I think they're going to be very informative because there'll be people who have been on this drug for four, five, six, seven years, and will be able to see, you know, if their disease uh, slows down and stops progressing, and that would that would be the hope. In the in the preliminary data, there was a hint that maybe folks were not only getting worse more slowly, but sort of stopping getting worse at all. And I mean, if that pans out, that would be really terrific information and would tell us this drug does have some efficacy. Uh, but I I don't know anything about when they would start the next more definitive studies. And how long have you been in Alzheimer's research? I've been in Alzheimer's research about uh, 25 years. <laughs> How do you keep going? It must be a difficult thing. Well, it, it is. I mean, we have a disease that we can't can't cure, but what keeps me going is, is my patients and their families and our study participants. They're all amazing people. I get to know them over years. Unfortunately, many of my patients do, do get worse in the disease, but uh, they're, they're inspiring, and these folks fight this disease, and, and our research participants particularly are amazing people who put off with being poked and prodded and questioned and reminded that they have memory loss. Uh, and yet keep coming back year after year and are the ones who make, you know, progress possible. 
Washington University neurologist, Dr. Joyce, Joyce Snyder. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for being one of our local people on the forefront of research. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was terrific. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.